When I start teaching my students at university about genetics in their first week at university, they come to my first lecture and they don't know what to expect, but I suppose they think they're going to learn about how genes rule everything. And to suggest that might be true, or to hint that it might be true, I ask them, first of all, to look to the person to their left and the person to their right. And they do that, and then I say, quite accurately, that two out of the three of them will die for reasons connected to the genes they carry. Now, I don't know which two, but it is the case that about two-thirds of the people today will die for, from conditions like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's disease, all of which have certainly got a strong genetic component. So the students look a bit depressed by that, and I then say to them, but cheer up, because if I'd been giving this lecture in Shakespeare's time, two out of every three of you would be dead already. And that's true, because in Shakespeare's time, 1600s, only one English baby in three lived to be 21 years old. Even in Darwin's time, beginning of the 1900s, only one English baby in two made it to be 21 years old. But in modern times, 99% of English babies or European babies or most parts of Russia's babies make it to be uh, 21 years old. And that's because the way we die has changed. We used to die of things like cholera, of cold, of starvation, uh, in London of the terrible air and the fog, um, and that's more or less been conquered. But we all have to die at the end, in the end. And what we die now of is our own inborn weaknesses. So that might suggest that genetics is some kind of terrible fate, which you can be told when you're young what you're going to die of. But it's not really like that at all, because actually genetics simply tells you what kinds of environment, what kinds of nurture you are most at risk at. That's what I want to explore in this lecture, is the, is the, uh, the lack of connection between what the general public think of as genetics and what genetics really is. Genetics is a statement of what's dangerous or what's good for you in the world outside. It's not a statement of fate which can't be changed by the way you act. Now, I can illustrate that in various ways. One of the ways I like to do it is with cats. And cats have got lots of genetics, um, as do dogs and mice, but cats are perhaps uh, nice, nicer than either of those. Um, and there are plenty of mutations in cats, and many pe people know about black cats and white cats. And famously, there's this cat called the Siamese cat. The Siamese cat, of course, has got a white body and a black nose and ears and a tail. If it's a gentleman cat, it's got black testicles as well. Now, what, so what's happening with the Siamese cat? Well, it's got a mutation, a genetic change, an error in the biochemical pathway that makes the black pigment melanin. And if you've got a black cat, it's got black melanin pigment in its hair. If you've got a white cat, then that, the machine that makes melanin, which is a bit like a factory, uh, which has various steps on it, one of those steps is blocked. And so the material comes along and is stopped and it can't go any further and you've got a white cat. Um, the Siamese is a fault in that machinery, but it's an interesting fault because the machinery isn't broken, it's just damaged. And that means that the machine will work in conditions which are favourable for biochemical machines. In other words, in places where there's not too much energy when it's relatively cold. And what that means in turn is in, in the relatively cold parts of a Siamese body, that's the nose, the ears and the tail, and of course the testicles, which are both literally and metaphorically the coolest part of any male body, um, in those relatively cold parts of the body you have black pigment. In the relatively warm parts of the cat's body, which is the main body surface, uh, you don't have any black pigment because it's too warm. And if you want to make a dark coloured Siamese cat, simply take a Siamese kitten and keep it in a cold room you get a dark cat. Or if you want a light-coloured Siamese cat, take a Siamese kitten and keep it in a warm room and you'll get a light-coloured cat. So that the Siamese gene, the mutation, which you know really everything about, we know where it is, what's happened in the DNA, what's gone wrong in the pathway, that gene is greatly altered in its effects by the environment in which it's placed. And that's true of things much more important than Siamese cats. It's true, actually, it's behind the biggest epidemic that the human race has faced since the Great Plague. And the Great Plagues, of course, were in the 16th century, a bit later perhaps into the 18th century in parts of the world. It's been more or less conquered now, uh, but we're in the middle of one which people haven't noticed. And that's the plague of obesity, of being overweight.
And what's amazing about the obesity plague is how recent it's been. If you look at the figures for the United States, for people who are very fat, not just a little bit too fat, but morbidly obese, as we say, with, who are really almost circular and have, will certainly have difficulty in walking and might even have, diff might even have difficulty uh, in standing up, some of them, um, the number of those people in the United States has gone up in proportionate times, terms by something like 10 times in the last 30 years. So if you go back to 1985 and you draw a map of American obesity, there's only about four or five states, most of them in the South, where more than one person in 10 is, has that problem. If we look at the figures for 2015, just a, just a year or so ago from when I'm now talking, there are now more than half of states where more than one person in three has this problem of morbid obesity. And that's really, really important for health, because if you're obese, you have all kinds of problems. And the biggest and the most intractable problem is a condition called type 2 diabetes. And type 2 diabetes is, like type 1 diabetes, an inability of the body to deal with sugar. Now, both of them have to do with hormones. Type 1, as everybody knows, is an inborn and genetic failure of the ability to make a hormone called insulin. And insulin is actually an appetite hormone. It controls your sugar levels, and when your sugar levels go wrong, you feel hungry, okay? But these kids don't have insulin, and if they're not treated with insulin, they will certainly die. But we can treat them with insulin now, so that's fine. But type 2 is more complicated, but it comes when you eat far too much starch and sugar. Your body begins to say, metaphorically, look, the cells say, we don't want any more sugar, thank you very much. We're not, we're not taking any more sugar in. And so the sugar accumulates in your bloodstream and it does all kinds of damage. And the, the damage it does is devastating. It can lead to blindness, it can lead to heart disease, it can lead to brain damage, it can lead uh, quite quickly to ulcers which don't heal, so severe that many people with type 2 diabetes have to have an arm or a leg removed. It can lead to kidney failure, and in, in Britain where this, we have this problem, not as much as, the as in the States, half of the people on kidney dialysis machine, machines are, are there because of type 2 diabetes. So what's it due to? Is it genetic? Or is it environmental? Well, at first sight, it might seem obvious it has to do with the environment, with the presence of extraordinary amounts of very cheap, low-quality food. And to an extent, that's certainly true. Um, if you look at the, how long it takes the average working man, and I do mean man in this context, as we're talking in, in, in historical terms, to earn enough uh, money to feed a family of four, in the 1930s in the United States, it took the average man uh, two day, uh, three full days of work just to get food for himself and his wife and two children. Uh, last year took the average working man about half a day to get enough money to feed himself, his wife and uh, two children. Uh, but of course what's got cheaper has been low quality food, overwhelmingly sugars, fats, sweet drinks and that kind of stuff. So you could, sh you could say, well obviously this is due to an environmental change. The environment has changed, we have this new way of eating, we don't take exercise anymore, we spend our time looking into computers, so we've got fat, it's entirely environmental. Well, it's certainly environmental, but it certainly isn't in entirely environmental. In fact, it's what we call the, the Siamese cat of diseases. Because what happens is that some people, because of their genes, are uniquely at risk of falling prey to this terrible new environment. Now, obesity runs in families. Fat parents tend to have fat children. So you might say, if you were naive, that, that proves it's genetic. But actually, it's an interesting fact, not widely known, is that fat parents tend to have fat children and fat cats and fat dogs. And that's not because they share genes with their cat or their dog, at least I hope they don't. It's because they feed their pets too much in the same way they feed themselves too much and they feed their children too much. So you could say, well, it's genetic. But actually, it's more than that. We've, uh, we've talked about a fat cat a second ago. Let's talk about fat mice. And about 20 years ago, a mutation appeared in the laboratory line of mice called the obese mutation, where suddenly we had these inbred mice, all of them looking, all of them with the same genes, all of which were almost completely circular. They weren't like mice, they were like guinea pigs, you know, they were almost round. And they ate and ate and ate. If there was plenty of food, they just ate and ate and ate. And that was due to a mutation in a hormone, like, in, like insulin. It's a protein hormone that's called leptin. And it's, uh, we now know that it's an appetite hormone. But it's not like insulin, that when you're hungry, 
uh, insulin builds up um, and you, you go out and get some food. Leptin does the opposite. When you're eating, leptin builds up and you feel full, you stop. It's what we call a satiety hormone. And these poor mice don't have any leptin. They've got an error in that gene. Um, and so however much they eat, they will always feel hungry. And they will continue to eat until they're physically unable to do so, and they will get very obese. Uh, very occasionally, about one birth in 30,000, children are born with this condition, and they eat and eat and eat, and, that, and they get very obese. But you can cure them by, putting, by injecting them with leptin. So the genes are involved too. Now, one of the great failures of modern genetics is its failure to understand most of the things in human society which are inherited. Things like human height. It's obviously the case that tall parents have tall children, short parents have short children. There's obviously a lot of genes out there, the environment's involved too. But we haven't been able to find those genes. Or to put it another way, we found too many of them. Uh, the last time I looked, there was something like 150 genes very, whose variation was behind human height. And altogether, they only explained about 5 or 10% of the variation. So it was a big surprise to find uh, that there are a number of genes in the audience to this program uh, of people who have different genes uh, which don't appear to be abnorm abnormalities like leptin deficiency, but which alter the extent to which they feel hungry. Okay? And the first one was found in a very typically unexpected way in mice. It's called FTO in mice, and that stands for fused toes. Okay? And fused toes, as you might guess, it causes the mice to have its fingers and toes fused together. Okay? So that's humans sometimes do. Well, that's not very interesting, except that when you search the human genome for FTO, you find it there. You find exactly the same change in humans. But the thing which is quite bizarre and reminds us how little we know about genetics is that in humans, it's an appetite gene. Now, I happen to know it, that I've got two copies of the DNA letter A, um, AA, at a particular point in this gene. Um, about a quarter of the European population has two copies of the letter T um, it, in, in that position. And the rest of the population, about 60% or 70%, has one copy of A and one of T. Now, if you look at people who've got TT versus people who've got AA, right, um, they've got no knowledge whatsoever that this is the case. However, on the average, the TT people weigh three kilograms more than the AA people. And that's because this gene is active not in the stomach or the liver, but in the brain. It's an appetite gene, just like, uh, just like leptin. It makes you feel hungry, okay? And it makes you, or actually this one makes you want to stop eating. And the people with, um, with AA, the, the fatter ones, they need more food in order to stop eating because of their genes. And now we know something like 30 or 40 genes of that kind. So an awful lot of variation in people's appetite is genetic, okay? Again, just like Siamese cats. But of course, uh, when, we were talking, when we were talking about uh, Queen, Elizabeth, Queen uh, Elizabeth's time, or Shakespeare's time, or Darwin's time, for most people in Britain, for most people in the world, that was quite unimportant because there wasn't enough food around, however hungry they were, to allow them to become obese. Now there's an infinity of food around, and for some people, that's a big risk. Okay. And we're in a unique moment of human history because for the first time ever, the fat are the, are the poor, and the rich are the thin. And that, that's a complete reversal from what was the case only a century ago. And that's because of this new emerging interaction between nature and nurture, between genes and environment. Now, people don't like to think that somehow their genes are changing their behavior. Uh, people find that a very, very uncomfortable feeling. But it's true. And I can end up by Illustrating that with one obvious case in which it's true, that's another hormone, a hormone which about half of, fewer than half of all biological scientists have now got, and that's testosterone, the hormone that makes men into the wonderful creatures we are. Now, male behaviour is quite different from female behaviour, um, in many ways, which are, some of which are obvious and some of which are not. Men are much more willing to take risks than women are. Um, uh, Four-year-old boys are twice as likely to be killed by accidents as men are. Um, men are three times as more likely to be hit by lightning than women are. That's because they go on a golf course with a lightning conductor in their hand or they climb up to a tall spire or something like that. Um, so that men don't live as long as women, partly because of their you know, because of their, um, of, their, of their biology, of their hormones. Men are murdered at five times the rate that women are. To make up for that, men murder at ten times the rate 
that women do. And that's universal across the world. The murder rate by men is 10 times greater than the murder rate by women in Britain and in, let's say, the United States. The figures are almost exactly the same. The same in, same in China, the same in Singapore, the same in Russia, the same everywhere. But the interesting thing is the murder rate in Britain is about um, 25 murders per million people a year. 10 times more of the murderers are men. The murder rate in parts of the United States is 250 people per million per year. 10 times as many murderers are men than are women. So what are we going to do to solve the problem of murder? Well, we'll do what we've already done in most of Europe. You can't get guns. There's no need to be frightened. There aren't people chasing you around. Um, uh, people can control, control their anger. So we can change our behavior with social means. But that doesn't alter the fact that the genes are certainly important. So that's the odd message of this brief lecture, really, which is that the more you understand about genetics, the more, not the less, the environment it seems important.